Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 690 for the 26th of December. <clears throat> 2021. Richard Saunders coming to you from Sydney, Australia. The last Skeptic Zone for 2021. Do we look forward to 2022? The news coming out of Sydney, Australia, and Australia in general, I guess, is the, uh, the number of uh, new cases for COVID is growing rapidly every day, or almost every day. Yesterday wasn't so big a leap. Uh, but it seems, and hopefully this is a good sign, that with this uh, o- Omicron variation, the hospitalization numbers aren't as bad. But we will just have to wait and see. I'm going to be waiting until early next month to get my booster shot. And before I get into what's coming up on this week's show, that reminds me of something an anti-vaxxer conspiracy theorist left a comment on the Australian Skeptics Facebook page the other day, saying, how many booster shots will it take before the Australian Skeptics are sceptical of vaccines? You know, they, they, they think that's a funny, witty, insightful thing to say. And I guess the comment I want to make generally is, if I was to try to sum up the last couple of years with COVID, one of the striking things that's certainly brought to the attention of the world is the sheer, oh, the sheer number of conspiracy theorists and such who are prepared to, uh, you know, march in the streets, which we will get to later in the show, by the way. There's a story coming up about that. And go online and to the extent where, as we know, especially in the United States, thousands of these people have died because they will not take the vaccination. Uh, it reminds me of what's the harm? Well, what's the harm in conspiracy theories is that, uh, uh, well, the death toll, I think, speaks for itself. And we can only wonder how many of those thousands of people would still be alive today if they didn't believe online conspiracy theories and such like. A good case for science and reason and skepticism. But yes, coming up on this week's show, we look at flags, the Magna Carta, and anti-vaxxers, sort of inspired by the uh, the protest I happened across the other week here in Sydney, the anti-vax conspiracy theory sovereign citizens freedom protest, and at the suggestion of our wonderful reporter Michelle Bickersma in Melbourne, who's always got an eye out for a good story. Thank you, Michelle. I cover some of the interesting things these people are saying and, and why they say it, specifically about... Um, the upside-down red Australian flag, which they like to carry, and quoting the Magna Carta. Oh yes, that's coming up at the top of the show. Then after that, it's the Australian Skeptics Newsletter, read read beautifully and professionally by Adrian Hill in Canada. Now, people listening in Canada, if you uh, are looking for an exquisite voiceover artist, I think Adrian Hill would fit your bill. Have a listen, and I'm sure you'll agree with me. Good work, Adrian. Then once again, we go to the Trove Archives. Well, this time I think it's archives from around the world, digitized newspapers, and we look for references to Oregon Energy, which is one of these mysterious energies unknown to science. Stay tuned at the end of the show for more words and uh, points from me. But now it's time for me to run downstairs and dive, dive into the giant bag of roasted peanuts my sisters gave me for Christmas. Oh my goodness me, it is huge. It must be, it must be the size of two basketballs put together. You have no idea. And they're roasted to perfection. Oh yum, while I do that. Thank you sisters. While I do that, I hope you enjoy the Skeptic Zone. Now, 
Now, you may remember on last week's episode, I relayed the story of me uh, happening across an anti-vaccination conspiracy theory protest in downtown Sydney outside the law courts, which was near our state parliament. And the audio you can hear is from the video I shot. And I thought I'd take a little bit of time today to look at some of the banners and some of the symbols and whatnot these people are carrying or were carrying on the day and typical of what uh, these sort of people do. And again, just viewing the video at the moment, people are wearing various conspiracy theory t-shirts, freedom, 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 lots of flags, which we'll get to in a moment, and not one of them of the 150, 200 people I'm viewing in my video at the moment gathered around the law courts, not one of them was wearing a mask. And I made the point last week that uh, when I walked by making my video, various people were bleating at me bah, as if to call me a sheeple, a sheeple. These banners, these posters, these, what are they called, placards, a sort of mostly handmade, drawn on bits of cardboard with sticks and things like that. And there's even a man who was blind there with his guide dog. And his banner read something like, I may be blind, but I can see the truth. Something like that. And as I view this video, and this is one of the first things we'll mention, there's one of the protesters carrying an upside down Australian flag, which is red. A red upside down Australian flag. And it's prompted me at the request or the suggestion of our reporter Michelle Bickersmar in Melbourne who came across some information about uh, why do protesters carry a red upside down Australian flag. Many of them are simply carrying Australian flags upside down and right side up as if to say they're the true patriots. I think they get this from watching too many American videos sometimes. But as I turn down the audio on the protest as they march around the corner from the law courts to Parliament House and I think probably not much happened after that. Let's take a closer look as to why many of these protesters over the last year or so, going back into the early days of the pandemic, mid-pandemic, are carrying upside down red Australian flags. And various information I've gathered under Australian national flag protocols, the flag should never be flown upside down. I think, I think in some situations it's actually a code for danger or distress or something like that. Upside down flags have been used around the world as a protest symbol, including the Capitol Hill riots in Washington in January. And uh, as some Skeptic Zone fans may remember, the prediction team were meeting accidentally, as it happened, and we all decided to watch the uh, the counting of the votes, and that's when the riots happened, so that was quite dramatic. However, getting back to the red flag, the Australian red ensign resulted from the Commonwealth Government's 1901 Federation flag design competition, which required two entries, a flag for official Commonwealth Government use and another for the Merchant Navy. The winning design was based on the traditional British red ensign and featured the Southern Cross and Commonwealth Star. So it's pretty much the same as the Australian flag, which has the um, the Union flag in the corner. And we have the Southern Cross and the Federation Star on the flag. It's easy to look up and see what that's all about on a blue background. And, and we have this one, which is for the Merchant Navy. And it's on a red background. Now, according to the conspiracy theorists and the sovereign citizens and the freedom fighters, under their version of the law, individuals are sovereign, meaning they are not bound by the laws of the country in which they live unless they waive those rights by accepting a contract with the government. And I think some weeks ago we ran a story from Shelley Stocken about sovereign citizens. A lot of these people are sort of bound up, wrapped up in this sort of uh, fringe uh, belief at Federation, which was in 1901, when all the states of Australia, which were independent states, came together to form the Commonwealth of Australia. It, it's interesting that Australia could almost be called the United States of Australia. It's the same sort of idea. We had independent colonies, independent 
entities, New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, and so on. And in 1901, we federated, we became really the country of Australia. Uh, At Federation, Australia was not an independent country, but a dominion of the British Empire. Australian citizens did not exist until 1948, and the UK Parliament could theoretically pass laws governing Australia until 1986, so not that long ago. And it boils down to the fact that the blue flag we use today really didn't become the national flag until 1953. Well, officially. Before that date, if citizens wanted a distinctive flag to signify an Australian rather than a British identity, they tended to use the red flag. So why do sovereign citizens and freedom fighters tend to use the red flag? Probably because they see it being used in other demonstrations, and it's regarded as being more the people's flag, well, at least in their own minds. The red ensign has now become associated more with sovereign citizens groups who believe that the admiralty law was the only valid law. The supporters of this fringe movement believe that the Australian laws do not apply to them, believing that state governments and their police forces have no legitimate power to enforce coronavirus laws, lockdown and vaccination mandates. And some of them have been identified as potential terrorism threats by the New South Wales police. Now, another thing that caught my attention was the sign being held up by one protester that said, quote, the hospitals are filled with jab victims, end quote. Now, this is a strangely common conspiracy theory that the hospitals aren't filled with COVID victims or that the numbers of COVID victims aren't increasing. It's people who actually got sick from the vaccination itself. Now, while some people report to having adverse reactions ranging from feeling a bit unwell to sore arms and so on, under no possible stretch of the imagination are hospitals filling up with people who are having adverse reactions to vaccines or dying from vaccines. It's simply a lie, to be blunt. But it's a lie these people willingly believe because it fits their narrative. Indeed, as I record this, the new, the, uh, the new numbers here in New South Wales are approaching 6,000 cases. 6,000 cases. It's growing exponentially and the number of people in hospital suffering from COVID is rising. But now let's look at one of the notices that these protesters were sticking up all over the front of the law courts here in Sydney, which I seem to recall were shut anyway, so they went into a sort of a glass foyer, and they were sticking up these notices everywhere, photocopies, colour and black and white. Now here's one, and at the top, bizarrely enough, we have the coat of arms of Queen Elizabeth II. Go figure. It says, Attention, all persons entering this building. This building has been lawfully seized under Clause 61 of Magna Carta on the 7th of January 2019 and remains seized until a lawful state and federal parliament are elected. There you are, they couldn't even be bothered to print up a new sign and the state's from 2019 for some reason. It goes on. Further, a lawful governor-general must be appointed along with lawful governors. Entry to these buildings is by lawful officers of the Crown who have sworn the lawful oath contained in the Commonwealth of Australian Constitution Act 1900, UK, and the Commonwealth Constitution 1901, as proclaimed and gazetted. All other entry is trespass, and you, capitals, will be prosecuted by order of the people who are the Commonwealth of Australia. Strong legal words, indeed, or are they? Of course, needless to say, it's nonsense, but out of curiosity, let's read Clause 61 of the Magna Carta. Now, of course, the Magna Carta is an incredibly important historical legal document. The English Charter of Freedoms from 1215, signed by King John. And according to uh, Wikipedia, Magna Carta, Great Charter of Freedoms, commonly called Magna Carta, also, also the Great Charter, is a royal charter of rights agreed to by King John of England at Runnymede near Windsor on the 15th of June, 1215. 
It promised the protection of church rights, protection for the barons from illegal imprisonment, access to swift justice, and limitations on feudal payments to the crown to be implemented through a council of 25 barons. And it is the basis of many modern laws, of course, but but at heart, of course, it is an important historical document. But anyway, let's get to Clause 61. Since we have granted all these things for God, for the better ordering of our kingdom, and to end the disagreement that has arisen between us and our barons, we agree that the barons shall elect twenty-five of their number to watch over and keep the peace and liberties granted and confirmed to them by this charter. If we, our chief justice, our officials, or any of our servants offend in any respect against any man, and the offence is made known to four of the said twenty-five barons, they shall come to us, to declare it and claim immediate redress. If we make no redress within forty days, the four barons shall refer the matter to the rest of the twenty-five barons, who may distrain upon and assail us in every way possible with the support of the whole community of the land, by seizing our castles, lands, possessions, or anything else saving only our own person and those of the Queen and our children, until they have secured such redress as they have determined upon. Having secured the redress, they may then resume their normal obedience to us. Any man who desires may take an oath to obey the commands of the twenty-five barons for the achievement of these ends, and to join with them in assailing us to the utmost of his power. We give public and free permission to take this oath to any man who so desires, and at no time will we prohibit any man from taking it. Indeed, we will compel any of our subjects who are unwilling to take it to swear it at our command. So that's Clause 61. And from that, these conspiracy theorists and sovereign citizens and freedom fighters think that that gives them the right to possess public law courts. It makes about as much sense as a lot of what they claim. As I said before, the Magna Carta is an important historical document. But I'll end with this thought, that the people at this protest carrying their signs saying vaccines don't work, COVID is a hoax, the hospitals are filled with jab victims and so on. What is particularly poignant and particularly sad is that when some of these people come down with COVID, which will happen, and some of those people who come down with COVID end up in hospital in a very, very bad way, if they publicize the fact on social media, the other people at this protest will turn on them. Will turn on them, claiming that they are shills and part of the conspiracy. Why? Because it's happened before. So we now wait and see what the rest of this month in January will bring us. But the way the numbers are going at the moment, we can only... We can only imagine. Hello, this is Maynard. Did you know that you can listen to The Skeptic Zone on YouTube? Yes, I know, sounds crazy, but it's true. Also, you can hear 40 Logical Fallacies with Michelle Bickersma and Funny Sketches with Richard Saunders and a host of other sceptics. Just click on the YouTube links on the homepage at skepticzone.tv.
Hello, this is Adrian Hill from Canada with newsletter number 138 from the Australian Skeptics, compiled and written by none other than Tim Mendham. Remember, there are links to each story and you can see those when you subscribe to the newsletter at skeptics.com.au. Hi all, it says. Our last newsletter for 2021, and what a year it has been, though there's no need to remind everybody about that. Here is looking to a much better 2022. Meanwhile, there's still the festive season, Saturnalia, summer winter solstice, Hanukkah, which has already been and gone, Christmas, and of course, Jimmy Buffett's birthday. Read on. Tim. Australian Skeptics News. Psychic Project full results are released. The results of the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project, a 12-year study by Australian skeptics, have been released. An in-depth report has been published in the latest issue of The Skeptic, and has also been published as a sample article from that issue. The project revealed that so-called psychics' predictions are right only 11% of the time, and when something momentous or infamous happens, they are unlikely to have foreseen it. Under the supervision of Skeptics Chief Investigator Richard Saunders, the survey covered over 3,800 predictions made between the years 2000 and 2020 by more than 200 Australian psychics. It took 12 years of diligent work by skeptics, trawling through magazines, newspapers, TV and radio, websites, YouTube and social media to compile as comprehensive a list of predictions as possible. It is easily the most detailed project of its kind ever attempted in Australia, and most likely the world. And the results. 11% of predictions are correct. 15% expected, as in stating the bleeding obvious. 19% are too vague, 2% are unknown, and 53% wrong. The results indicate nothing better than educated guessing, or even uneducated guessing and certainly no better than any non-psychic could do, and probably a lot worse. And you can also hear the full report on the last episode of this podcast. $3 million fine for advertising hyperbaric oxygen devices. The Federal Court of Australia has ordered OxyMed Australia to pay $2 million for advertising medical devices intended to administer hyperbaric oxygen therapy in breach of the Therapeutic Goods Act. The devices, which pump oxygen into pressure chambers at ambient pressure higher than atmospheric pressure, were advertised for the treatment of serious diseases and medical conditions, including Alzheimer's disease, cerebral palsy, dementia, COVID-19, stroke, HIV AIDS, cancer, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. The court also ordered Malcolm Hooper, the director of OxyMed, to pay $1 million in penalties for aiding, abetting, counseling, or procuring the contraventions of the act by OxyMed. The court found that OxyMed's advertising was, quote, intended to engender in the unscientifically trained and vulnerable reader a perception of credibility as to the claims of hyperbaric oxygen therapy as a treatment, end quote, and that the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy to treat most of those conditions was not supported by scientific evidence. The court further concluded that OxyMed and Hooper, quote, have a practice of posting pseudoscientific articles targeted at a vulnerable audience, end quote. Vaccine fakes. Claims man received 10 COVID vaccinations in one day. Unbelievable. New Zealand health authorities are investigating claims that a man received up to 10 COVID-19 vaccination doses in one day on behalf of other people in the latest efforts by members of the public to skirt tough restrictions on the unvaccinated. So let's get this straight. You think vaccines are dangerous, but it's okay to get someone else to have one for you 10 times? It's crazy. And a man tries to get a shot in a fake arm. A man in Italy wore a thick theater corset covered in rubber foam to which two foam arms were attached in what is assumed to be an attempt to skirt vaccine mandate laws. The nurse administering the vaccination said that it was, quote, quite well made, end quote. 
His goal was apparently to obtain a vaccination certificate, enabling him to go to work without actually getting the shot. 2. GB host Ray Hadley destroys cowardly anti-vax listener. Veteran radio broadcaster Ray Hadley lashed out at an anti-vax listener on air following an email he had received calling him a coward for not allowing conspiracy theorists to express their views on his talkback show. Hadley was infuriated and called the listener a dickhead. Quote, I expect that during World War II, you'd be prepared to listen to the rantings of Hitler and give him equal time as well. Perhaps you think pedophiles have a point, and perhaps I should air their views on here. End quote. He continued, saying that anti-vaxxers would never have a voice on his radio program. Quote, anti-vaxxers are a scourge on society and will never get any traction here, never have and never will. End quote. Hadley had previously locked horns with his former on-air colleague, Alan Jones, over the latter's promotion of COVID misinformation and anti-lockdown protests. Pseudoscience movement wants to wipe germs from existence. According to this article, quote, science skeptics are flocking toward a fringe set of beliefs called terrain theory, an ideology that ranges from total denial of the existence of viruses and bacteria to the belief that lifestyle choices alone force otherwise benevolent microbes to transform into pathogens, end quote. The central gist of this 160-year-old theory is that the body's terrain, not germs, creates disease. In the Facebook group, Terrain Model Refutes Germ Theory, which has grown from 147 followers to 20,700 since the beginning of the pandemic, one member who tested positive for COVID-19 speculated that he fell ill because he broke his ankle. Another member argued that, quote, measles is a developmental cleansing, end quote. Oh dear. <laughs> How to spot a spiritual impersonator scam on Instagram. This is a story about imposters cloning accounts of high profile authors, tarot readers, psychics, mediums, witches, etc. They mimic the bio and repost several of the same Instagram photos. Once they've established their profile, they will then proceed to go through their target's follower list and begin following and messaging those people, trying to offer them psychic readings, tarot readings, or magical workings. Sometimes they will ask for payment first, and sometimes they will give a poor reading and ask for payment before proceeding. Once you've paid, they will block you. The article complains that, quote, without asking the legal questions of why is Instagram allowing this to happen, or if a class action lawsuit for identity theft and financial damages is possible, it's clear that Instagram doesn't care about the safety of both the person being impersonated and more importantly, those being scammed, end quote. Warning, really annoying pop-up ads. The December 2021 issue of The Skeptic, the magazine from Australian Skeptics, is out, and it features complete coverage of the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project, possibly the largest of its kind ever undertaken, and destined to be a reference for future discussion on the topic of psychics. So, if you haven't subscribed yet, now is the time to do so. Contact the editor if you're not sure if your existing subscription needs renewing. Events. While some skeptics groups are running their regular skeptics in the pub get-togethers online, same talks but bring your own beer, an increasing number are returning to the live face-to-face -face format. Check your local guides to see when and where such activities are on, or if they are on, considering any COVID restrictions. Skeptics in action. If you have any ideas for stories or want to contribute to Skeptics Communications, such as the magazine or Facebook page, or just have something you want to get off your chest, then you're welcome to get in touch. News leads should be sent to newstips at skeptics.com.au. Submissions for the magazine, etc. should go to editor at skeptics.com.au. Comments and suggestions, even those rude ones, should also go to editor at skeptics.com.au. Items of interest. Aliens preparing to make contact, according to Yuri Geller. Here we go. A polyglot of paranormalities, UFOs, ancient astronauts, 
crashed saucers, CIA psychic warfare, Pentagon and NASA secrets, spy missions, acoustic energy, ESP experiments on the moon, Werner von Braun, ex-astronaut Mitchell, and Yuri Geller, who has a new book out, What a Coincidence. Several witnesses spot the Chicago Mothman. Normally associated with West Virginia, witnesses have now claimed they have seen another version of the flying monster, the Chicago Mothman, in the Winnebago County area, named no doubt for its large population of extra-long caravans. This credulous story basically just quotes eyewitness reports and leaves it at that. But we want to know why Motorman traveled all that way, a distance of upwards of a thousand kilometers. Heck, New York would have been closer. And Broadway would have been attractive. There's lots of lights there, one for each broken heart, apparently. Silliest story of the week. From cancer researcher to psychic healer using unicorn energy. Single mom, Callista McGillivray, tossed in her research job with a pharmaceutical company in February of 2006 and studied to become a master teacher in Reiki, alongside earning a diploma in herbal medicine. She now specializes in using angel and unicorn energy to treat people and has shared her methods with over 1,000 teachers worldwide. She experienced judgment and rejection from her peers. Quote, but was certain she was on the right path when she saw angels while meditating, end quote. She later saw a unicorn while running her holistic therapy company. As an aside, this reminds me of the unicorn tear stickers I got from Celestia Ward in my Skepticrate a while back. They're to be placed on hand sanitizer bottles. They're for fun, and I love it because it says they're 150% effective. And of course, they're not to be taken seriously. And that's all for now. Until 2022, this is Adrian Hill signing off from the land of waffles, maple syrup, and right now, really cold temperatures. Hi, this is Rob Palmer. I write the well-known Skeptic column in Skeptical Inquirer Online, and I'm a team member of the Guerrilla Skeptics on Wikipedia Project, GSOW. But you fine folks may know me because I contributed segments for several episodes of this podcast. Check out my interviews from PsychOn 2019, starting with episode 576. So here's a little known fact. All of my skeptical activism stems from discovering the Skeptic Zone. Yep, I first heard of the GSOW project right here back in 2012 due to Richard's selfless support of it and other skeptical activities around the world. I can honestly say I'd likely still be a skeptical couch potato if I hadn't discovered this podcast. So besides giving back to The Zone by contributing occasional segments, I contribute to the success of the show with ongoing monthly micropayments. And I'm asking you to consider doing the same. You can do that by following the Patreon or PayPal links at skepticzone.tv. Every donation supports the show, and Richard will really appreciate it. Once again, to dive into those pages at Trove at trove.nla.gov.au, your online resource for Australian digitised newspapers and so on. Well, in the spirit of Trove, we're actually looking at some American archives this week, and we will be looking for references to Orgon Energy. What is Orgon Energy? Well, it's one of these so-called energies unknown to science which has all sorts of claims made about it, not least coming from the website of Orgon Effects Australia, an outfit that sell products that uh, <clears throat> use this so-called energy. What do we have here? A glance at their web page brings us a, what appears to be a resin semi-sphere, a dome, 
at $198. We have a Geo Cleanse Gold Home and Workplace Harmonizer for $189. We have other little domes for sale, a pendant for $58, other pendants, and an inner band for $30. Nine dollars, which looks suspiciously like the old power balance bands from years ago. A pet pendant for fifty-eight dollars. A mobile phone and Wi-Fi radiation harmonizer for thirty-five dollars. A little sticker you put on the back of your watch for thirty-five dollars. One for your keyring for your car at seventy-nine dollars. Inner soles for your shoes at forty-one dollars. A water and food rejuvenation plate which is a bit of plastic you put food and water on for $57. I think you get the idea. Now, this company has been taken to task by people such as Choice Magazine, and I seem to recall that the Orgon effects threatened to sue Choice for making negative comments about their products. We are skeptical. Oh yes, we are skeptical of Orgon Energy, but what is Orgon Energy? According to Wikipedia, Orgon is a pseudoscientific concept variously described as an esoteric energy or hypothetical universal life force, originally proposed in the 1930s by William Reich. Now, ultimately, William Reich ended up in prison and died there in the 1950s. It is, suffice it to say, it's like Reiki or like any of these uh, fantasy energies. It can do everything and... Uh, it is undetectable to science, of course. But let's see what we can find out in some digital archives. And our first port of call is from the High Point Enterprise newspaper, dated the 31st of October 1963. And I'm sorry, I haven't noted where this is from. It's somewhere in the States. Medical quacks reap one billion yearly by Earl Ubel. Herald Tribune News Service, Washington. The modern medical quack trades in fear and pseudoscience and collects one billion from Americans annually. He collects for relief of almost any disease from hemorrhoids to cancer. He is particularly skillful in collecting a payoff in those ailments like arthritis which are chronic and painful but which have baffled orthodox medicine. He collects by peddling the most unbelievable gadgets, seemingly based on the most up-to-date scientific ideas, magnetism, ionization, and electronics. He specializes in machines that create radio noises, flashing lights, wiggling needles, and tingling sensations. He collects for nostrums, often disguised as cosmetics, that promise rejuvenation in the form of wrinkle removers, skin whiteners, hair restorers, and bust amplifiers. As one passed down the aisles of an incredible exhibit set up at the National Congress on medical quackery here, one wondered who in the 20th century would be taken in by these scientific fakes. Commissioner George P. Larrick of the Food and Drug Administration told the Congress that the gullible numbered in the tens of thousands gypped by devices alone, not to mention those taken in by food faddists. And a quick pause here to say that that word gypped has uh, been brought to my attention that it is a rather a negative uh, a racially charged word. Um, so f apologies for that if anybody is uh, taking it takes umbrage. It does come up again in a, in a latter story, but I'll just acknowledge that. In one corner stood the famous organ box resembling an undersized country outhouse. <laughs> it is the brainchild of the late Dr. Wilhelm Reich, who, until he took up with Orgon, was a respected psychoanalyst. Dr. Reich believed in the mysterious Orgon energy that came from space. It entered the body and healed. A lack of Orgon energy produced illness. To collect the energy, Dr. Reich built the Orgon box of alternating layers of steel wool, and rock wool sandwiched between cellotex and galvanized sheet metal. You just sat in it, accumulated organ energy, and you got well, even of cancer. 
the Food and Drug Administration moved in on Dr. Reich, and after a lengthy trial, he was sentenced to two years in jail, where he died. The organ box came under the classification of do-it-yourself quack devices that included health lamps, massage belts, electro-galvanic bracelets, a bust developer that looked like a plumber's helper, and a high-frequency generator designed to cure inflammation of the udder in cows. A few steps away, you could find the devices sold to quack doctors to gull their patients. A particularly lovely number had the name Sonus Filmosonic 105. The doctor, in quotes, pressed a button, turned on an impressively scientific knob, and some music came on. The music was piped into two electrified pads that he applied to the trouble spots on the body. The manufacturer contended that, quote, holiday for strings, end quote, cured arterial sclerosis and smoke gets in your eyes, did wonders for cancer. In almost every case, the quack tries the word, in, a, in almost every case, the quack ties the word science to his device, food, cosmetic or drug, and in recent years, according to Deputy Postmaster General Sidney W. Bishop, the phony healer has become more subtle and more astute in his manipulation of pseudoscience, fear, and modern medical knowledge. That is making it hard for law enforcement agencies to fight him. And I'll just quickly stop here and say, wow, wow, this is what, 1963? Over 50 years ago, nearly 60 years ago, hardly anything has changed. We read on. Commissioner Larrick pointed out that the government has the burden of proof that a device doesn't work or can do harm. He said he would like to see the same law applied to gadgets that is now applied to drugs, putting the burden of scientific evidence on the manufacturer. Yet it remains a paradox that in this era of scientific achievement, quackery should still abound. Dorothy Thompson suggested 25 years ago that as the public grew to know more about science, they would be more vulnerable to quackery. Various speakers at the Quackery Congress brought out the possible reasons for this strange situation. One big strange situation. One big reason. Human suffering strips away reason. In 1905, Samuel Hopkins Adams made his observation when he wrote a series of magazine articles that resulted in the first Food and Drug Act. He said, quote, The average American loses his native commercial shrewdness when he ventures into the marketplace to purchase relief from suffering. End quote. This last-ditched stand against death accounts for the persistence of the weirdest cancer treatments ever devised. Quackery also survives because many diseases, including cancer, last for long periods with alternating swings of good and bad health. So any nostrum, even clean water, could claim a cure for providing relief in a significant number of cases. This up-and-down characteristic of chronic ills also accounts for the self-delusion by many doctors who believe they have a cure. Some fringe practitioners win patients by attacking authority, a fine old American custom. They point to the American Medical Association as a, quote, medical monopoly, end quote. Therefore, it must be wrong. Of course, the AMA often makes it easy for quacks by the public stands it takes on medical economics positions that can easily be turned against doctors as, quote, a bunch of money makers, end quote. And sometimes doctors have to backtrack on earlier medical opinions. But the most potent source of the quack's weapons comes from the huge body of medical literature. With thousands of scientists doing hundreds and thousands of experiments, medical publishing has reached fantastic proportions. So by holding himself up in a medical library, a quack can soon find a shelf of medical studies to support almost any kind of nostrum. This is particularly true in diet, where at least one 
quote, food advertiser, end quote, shows the most spectacular open field running through tons of medical journals and books to come up with theories to support the current products he sells. Even advance in medicine brings with it the quack variations. Thus, with the increasing importance of obesity control, the number of devices, drugs and diets on the open market has multiplied prodigiously. Of course, to combat quackery effectively means an increasing measure of government control over medicine. It is a price we have to pay, but in the end it may be a small one when measured against the loss in lives and income from medical quackery. And now we come to a report published on the 14th of May 1972, Jefferson City News and Tribune. And this is by Margaret Taylor. Beware, millions gypped by health quackery devices. Step right up. Only one dollar will buy you this bottle of magic elixir guaranteed to cure arthritis, cancer, wrinkles, overweight and baldness. Few are gullible enough today to believe that old medicine man spiel. But people are spending millions of dollars each year on worthless health products and services. Today's medicine men don't wear frock coats and top hats and work out of a wagon. They pose as educated lecturers, door-to-door salesmen and members of the medical profession. Regulation of this type of health quackery started in 1906 with the passage of the first pure food and drug laws. Those and subsequent laws haven't stopped quackery. Devices, drugs and food items continue to be confiscated by the government and many are displayed at the National Museum of Quackery in St. Louis. 47 area residents visited the museum in a consumer protection tour Tuesday organised by Mrs. Shirley P. Drinkard, area family economist and management specialist for the University of Missouri Extension Division. Her purpose in organising the tour was to make people conscious of the many forms of health quackery and to recognise good health products and services. Items of quackery on display at the museum, a joint project of the St. Louis Medical Society and the U.S. Department of Health, Education and Welfare, Food and Drug Administration, include reducing creams, arthritis remedies, cancer treatments, health foods, diagnostic devices, cosmetic quackery, hormones, baldness cures, breast developers, and air purifiers. While many of these items are merely worthless, some actually endanger life and health or lull the user into a false sense of security so he does not seek proper medical help. Why the quackery has definite signs of recognition, people can avoid its traps by merely using common sense. Since quackery flourishes in an atmosphere of pain, serious illness and fear, the FDA give the following checkpoints to help non-medical persons recognise health quackery. Point. The word secret is a danger signal. Point. Promise of one device or drug to cure a variety of ailments. Point. Claims of persecution by the medical profession. Point. Use of advertisements, case histories and testimonials. Point. Promise of quick and easy cures. Displays at the National Museum of Quackery can be divided into general classifications of cures and treatments for arthritis, nutrition and diet, cosmetic problems and general cure-alls. Rheumatoid arthritis is made to order for health quacks because the pain comes and goes. There is no known cure and since it is a long-term disease, it discourages its victims. The Arthritis Foundation estimates that frauds and rackets robbed arthritis victims of over $400 million last year. Although progress has been made in the disease's treatment, quote, don't believe anyone who says he has a cure for arthritis, end quote. A common, relatively inexpensive device that many arthritis sufferers swear by is the copper bracelet, ring or disc. The FDA has seized these devices when advertising claims they help arthritis. A museum tour guide, Sharon Petty, explained that the only possible benefit of these items to arthritis victims was psychological. Nutrition and diet quackery abounds with both drugs and devices. The FDA has confiscated numerous drugs 
vibrators and machines that claim weight can be lost without dieting. Charles Zimmerman, curator of the National Museum of Quackery, explains that any device or drug making this claim is automatically confiscated because under normal circumstances no person can lose excess fat without eating less food than his body uses. He adds that any vibrator or other device that claims to remove inches from the body in such areas as the waist are also quackery. Zimmerman explains that the decrease in measurements is recorded after the use of devices because muscles and nerve endings contract to get away from the source of irritation. In the area of food fadism, common false advertising listed by the FDA include claims that improper processing, deterioration during storage and growth of food on depleted soil make common foods useless. FDA spokesmen explain that these and other claims are usually accompanied by a pitch to sell health foods, expensive vitamins, and scores of books and pamphlets. Cures for cosmetic problems can be generally dismissed as totally ineffective. FDA publications state that there is no way to prevent wrinkles or remove them with miracle hormone or rejuvenating creams. There is no known drug or hormone preparation or device that can significantly postpone, retard, or cure hereditary baldness, and there are no youth-restoring drugs or devices. General cure-alls are usually found as machines that collect and distribute some ray or force. A common claim of these machines is that they both diagnose and treat diseases including cancer, heart, and circulatory problems. The organ energy accumulator devices distributed by Dr. Wilhelm Reich claim to collect cosmic energy called organ to cure almost any illness. This device is still on sale in New York State and as long as it stays away from interstate sale or commerce is apparently safe from seizure. Another common health fraud, often called a microdiameter, claims to measure electric currents in the body and is unsafe as well as ineffective. The theme of the National Museum of Quackery comes through as don't be panicked into purchase of unproven items, but to always seek competent medical advice and then follow that advice. And the picture accompanying this article is of a an old gentleman in a accumulator box with a sort of a speaking trumpet pointed towards his face. A bit strange. Organ cure, it says. This organ box was reputed to draw in a form of cosmic energy known as organ, which allegedly could cure cancer, sexual impotency, and practically any other human ailment. National Center of Quackery curator Charles Zimmerman also demonstrates other organ energy dispensing devices. A funnel for use on the head and a shoulder box for a localized application. The distributor of organ treatments, Dr. Wilhelm Reich, died in jail in 1957 while serving a term for selling these devices in defiance of a court order. News Tribune photo. So there we go, some references in history to organ energy and devices mixed up with other quackery. And as I said, you can still buy these devices or similar devices, um, products that make claims about this mythical organ energy, even today. And even you today can look at archives and have an interesting time at trove.nla.gov.au and other newspaper archives from around the world, and you'll never know what you might find. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone, and thank you to listener Graham Donald, who has been sending me some interesting bits and pieces to do with conspiracy theorists and coronavirus and so on. I might sort of do something next week along the line of more uh, stories to do with that, people uh, appearing to be uh, persecuted because they got the vaccine, because they get the booster. It's The world is truly truly upside down 
But uh, it's good to know that we've got listeners out there who are keeping their eye on things. And uh, it's nice to have tips coming my way every now and then. And thank you to those people who continue to subscribe to The Skeptic Zone at skepticzone.tv. And of course, what I mean by that is they sign up with PayPal or Patreon and a little bit of... uh, a little bit of uh, their help comes my way each month by those methods, and it really adds up, and it really means the show can keep going. This beautiful microphone I'm speaking into, into at the moment, the Rode NT1A, which I bought about a year and a half ago, was due to uh, the generosity of listeners. I was able to get that, and I've been so happy. This is not a free, uh, this is not a free deal or a free plug for the road microphone people. I, well, I guess it is. I mean, it, they're not sponsoring in any sense. I bought this with uh, no deals in mind, but I'm happy to recommend it. If you want to start a podcast or you're doing a podcast and you're looking for that better microphone, then I've been entirely happy with the Rode NT1A. And for those technically minded, it has a, a, a very low or practically zero noise floor which uh, for recording purposes is very good. That coupled with the fact that I've got sound um, measures around the room, like some towels hanging up and something on the hard surface here and some foam around all go together well to hopefully bring you a better listening experience. And I'll refer once again to Adrian Hill in Canada, who impresses me no end with the the sheer um, audio quality of her recordings. I had hoped next year to go up to Canada to do a bit of a um, a skeptical tour. Well, we'll see. We'll see. It's just uh, the world is just still so un- unknown. Unknown? What's, that's not the term I'm looking for. The world is still... It's if Things are still up in the air. I'll, I'll put it that way. Coming up on next week's show, we look at more quackery when it comes to cancer cures. And yeah, we'll look at some of these uh, anti-vaxxers in more detail. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia, and signing off from the year 2021. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organization. Hello to the people who listen after the music. This is the return, haven't done this for a while, of the uh, the dice game. For those of you who don't know, this is the Easter egg sometimes where I roll a die and uh, you use your psychic powers, your dumb luck or whatever you want to do. You can listen to the show and listen to it again and then you'll get it right every time. You guess what number's going to come up. Today I have a D6, six-sided die, and I'll roll it three times. So guess away. One, two, three, four, five, or six. Here it comes. First number is one. This week, the first number is one. Second number coming up. Guess away. And (laughs) two. (laughs) That's quite easy to remember. One and two. And the last number coming up. I know Susan Gobek wants a five. It is Hmm, a two. Oh, well. The last numbers for 2021 are one, two, three. And two.